Welcome to the Bail in the Midwest podcast. Hello and welcome to the Bail in the Midwest podcast, where we explore a variety of topics related to bail, pretrial release, and the criminal justice system in the Midwest. My name is Shane Rolfe. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Kansas Bail Agents Association, and I've worked in this field for the past 35 years. Today, once again, we're going to be talking bail in the movies with the KBAA, or Kansas Bail Agents Association film critic, our very own Dennis Barrett. Aside from being our resident film critic, Dennis is also a longtime bail bondsman and an accountant and a member of the Kansas Bail Agents Association Board of Directors. Dennis, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Shane. Glad to be here. Today, we're going to be talking about the movie Jackie Brown, Quentin Tarantino's follow-up to his surprise smash hit, Pulp Fiction. But Jackie Brown is based on the novel Rum Punch by Elmore Leonard, who is one of the preeminent crime fiction authors around. A number of his other books have been adapted in movies, including Get Shorty and Be Cool with John Travolta, Out of Sight with George Clooney and Jennifer Lopez, 310 to Yuma with Russell Crowe and Christian Bale, the Justified TV series with Timothy Oliphant, and many, many others. Over 25 of Leonard's books and short stories have been turned into movies and television shows. Jackie Brown is a classic crime caper movie, kind of in the same vein as the Thomas Crown Affair and the Ocean Eleven movies, or for those of us a little older who like piano music, the, the quintessential caper movie, The Sting, with Paul Newman and Robert Redford. But Elmore Leonard's ability to craft characters and, and give them realistic voices, along with Tarantino's screenwriting, makes this one of my favorite movies featuring a bail bondsman that has ever been made. What are your thoughts on the movie just generally, and then we'll kind of get into the background. Well, Shane, I think you hit it hit it perfectly. I was about to say it's the quintessential bail bond movie because it actually portrays a true bail bond that I think is somewhat respectable and and uh, uh, maybe goes a little beyond some of his, his, his what he should be doing. But he is a a clean cut guy. It seems like he's uh, trustworthy and honest as best he can be. So, but I, I like the love the movie. Well, I think the clean cut, you point that out, because that's one of the things I was noticing as well. I mean, he's wearing slacks, he's wearing a, a polo pullover shirt. And he's not not the classic, you know, dog the bounty hunter looking bondsman that you know, looks like right. they just you know stepped out of a Hell's Angels you know, poster. So, you know, I, I think a lot of people identify in, in the bail bond industry, identify with him because of that, because more, most of us look more like we do than than the, the dog version of things. Right. So let's get some of our background here. Jackie Brown, the, the main character, is a flight attendant who is augmenting her income by smuggling cash back into the country for a small time, small time arms dealer, Ordell Roby, who is played masterfully by Samuel L. Jackson. When one of Ordell's other functionaries gets arrested, the whole scheme begins to unravel. Ordell's man, Beaumont, gets arrested, and Ordell knows that he needs to get him out of jail before he begins to talk to the cops. So he heads to the local bail bond office owned by bail bondsman Max Cherry, and we get our first introduction to Max Cherry and the bail bond business in this movie. Talk about that. He's ready to habitualize you. Is that what you want? You want to look at 10 years? Tomorrow I'll get you out, I promise. But that means I gotta pick you up tonight. Reggie, there ain't no two ways about it. You're gonna spend the night in jail. But I already told you I'm gonna get you out tomorrow. Now where are you? You're at your mother's actually. Put your mother out. Uh, Miss Gilmore. Miss Gilmore, this is Max Cherry. This is uh Reggie's that's right, his bail bondsman. Look, Reggie is in big trouble. I want to pick him up, and I want you to be responsible for him before I sit down. Yeah, I'd like you to make sure that he's there when I get there. And look, this is second chance for him. They don't get... That's correct. All right, so I'm counting on you to help me help your son. Thank you very much. Put him back on the line, please. All right, Reggie, we're clear on this. You got it? Good. Do yourself a really big favor and be there when I get there. How can I help you? Where can I put my ash? Use that cup there if you like. Oh, and I need me a bond for 10000 Okay. Max is trying. We, we first see Max. He's trying to talk a, a man named Reggie Gilmore into self-surrendering after a failure to appear. We only hear Max's side of the conversation, but, but this sounds pretty accurate to me. Max seems to be you know, telling it straight and honest to this Reggie guy, trying to get him back in. Does, 
from, from what we can tell is, does this seem like a fairly effective technique for convincing someone to come in and surrender after a fairy to appear? I mean, one of the things we do to, when we look at these movies is how accurate are they from a realistic standpoint? Is this one of the things that you go through when somebody's missed court? How do we get that person back in? Do we just go out and you know bang them over the head and bring them back in? Or, or are we talking, trying to make those arrangements to get them back in? This is actually that, the reason I love this movie is because I do feel like it portrays my business very, very correctly. I will call that person if they answer that phone and uh, I, I do have a contact with them. Uh, the best thing to do is get back in court, turn yourself in. The, 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 the key to anything is, is being quick about it, responding fast. And uh, if you turn yourself in, things go a lot smoother. Judges like it. You have a response to the judge. You can explain to them, I got a hold of this individual in this case, Reggie, and uh, he turned himself in or maybe even appeared in front of the judge at the next hearing date if there is a quick uh, turnaround. And it's kind of always that cross your fingers. I hope this works because this is a simple uh, way to help out the, the defendant as well as get things back on track a lot faster. I do this um, before I jump to the next step. Well, and one of the things that I really noticed on this is Max really seems to be being pretty honest with Reggie over this deal. You're going to spend the night in jail. This is this is going to happen. But hey, I'm going to get you out the next day where so many people, you know, in, in bounty hunters or other stuff, when they're trying to get people back in, the, it's they're not honest exactly over what's going to happen with people. Oh, no, no, just come back in. We're going to be OK. And then we'll just drop you off in jail. It, it seems to me that this straightforward approach, you know, is going to have better results than, you know, the, the people that we deal with are, are inclined to think that we're trying to trick them anyway. So if you can be honest and, and lay out the scenario to them in a, in a way that makes sense, you're probably going to get a better response than just trying to, you know, blow sunshine at them and get them to come back in. Right. And over time, I think that that gets around to the community that, oh, this person is a reliable source, a reliable person being a bondsman. We can trust what he says. And 99% of the time or most of the time that does occur. But as we all know, we're human and things sometimes can go awry. But uh, you're right. Most people get a little scared that, oh, no, I'm going back to jail. But if you can reassure them that we're there to help. And obviously he got a got a mother involved that at least two people now have the assurance that, OK, if something does come together, we're there to help. So, uh, no, I liked his approach. No, I agree. And I think it's, it's that that part seems very realistic. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, that's the sort of thing we do. Now, the clip ends with Ordell saying he needs a bond for $10,000, and then Max started getting some basic info on the situation. So let's let's listen to that as the follow-up here. All right, you want a $10,000 bond? What have you got to put up for collateral? Don't have to use cash. Do you have it with you? Got it right here in my Raptor bag. You have cash. What do you need me for? Come on, man, you know how they do black man show up with 10,000 cash, the first thing they want to know is where I got it. Then they're going to want to keep a big chunk of it, start talking that court call shit. Fuck that noise, Jack. I go through you. Cost you a thousand for the bond. I can do that. Who's it for? Relative? A fella named Beaumont. They got him down in county. Started out drunk driving, but they wrote it up as possession of a concealed weapon. Dumb monkey ass had a pistol on him. 10,000 sounds high. They run his name, got a hit. He been inside. Plus, he from Kentucky, and I think they kind of prejudice against brothers from down south out here. If he runs and I have to go to Kentucky to bring him back, you pay the expenses. You think you can do that? I've done it. What's his full name? Beaumont. That's all I know. Would you say that Beaumont is his first or his last name? Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say Beaumont's his Christian name. Okay, so a lot there. The first big warning sign to me is not knowing his last name. Beaumont's all that I know. It's like um, that. That's the first big red flag that pops up to me. You know, if somebody calls to, to, to post bond for someone, because we get those calls all the time. I need to bond out my friend. And all I know is, you know, street name or, or you don't really know the person because the girlfriend is sitting there next to you trying to feed you all the information. But the look on Max's face after that. So, I mean, is this does, does this seem like a fairly indicative conversation that you've had with people before oh daily daily and most of the time it's on the phone versus a person's actually sitting in front of you but uh when you're on the phone and you can just hear that other side and there's a pause what's his name and there's a pause 
like, well, if you really know this person, can't you just Shane, that's, that's your, I can name your name immediately. Right, exactly. And a pause. And then maybe there's some discussions in the background. You're thinking, Oh, this is going to go great. <laughs> Thanks for a great start to the day when that's the one you, you get first thing. Well, and then, you know, somebody talked to Robert Forster who plays Max Cherry and, and, and kind of gave that background because you can just see the look of exasperation on his face when he's like, that's all I know is his first name. I, I don't know what's going on with that. But, but there's several other aspects of that too, is, is the, the collateral for cash. You know, why do you need me? How often? Because it's not happening to me very often that anybody walks in and wants to pay me the fee plus give me the full bond in, in cash collateral. That's not, that's not a common thing for me. Exactly. And I think he, ex he received that correctly in, in response to why do you need me? If you've got the cash, just go post it. Uh, that's why it's called a cash or surety bond. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting too, but I, I, I appreciated uh, uh, Ordell's response and depending on where you're at in the different demographics, that, that could be a, a, a reason to uh, bring it to a bail bondsman. But uh, his face was like, okay. On the, in, when, uh, Max was was talking to Ordell. It was just interesting to to see the ongoings, and then he pull out a piece of paper and starts to write and first name or last name. I don't know, but you know, it just it was just. <laughs> I felt like I was doing a deja vu in some cases, like that was me in some cases. Yeah, me too. I mean, a couple other things that when you know first first thing out of there is bond sounds high. You know, he's like so. You know, the, the, as a bondsman, he knows what these charges are, and and if the bond is higher than normal. That's another, hey, red flag, warning sign. Hey, something else is going on with this case that we don't really know about. Maybe if we look into a little bit further, or maybe this person's not really telling us everything we need to know about this case if the bond is higher than normal for the type of charge. Correct. He mentioned that he was from Kentucky. And I, I kind of have to take a couple things here. In the original book, Rum Punch, uh, everybody said in South Florida, and so Beaumont and the people involved there are actually from uh, the Bahamas, from Nassau. So Beaumont uh, and, and I think somebody else from Jamaica as well. And so when, when they talk about in, in the book itself, if I have to go to, to the Bahamas to bring him back, you're going to pay the expenses. And he's like, oh, can you do that? Um, it's like, well, I've done it before. Kentucky, though, it might as well be the Bahamas as far as bail bonds are concerned, because Kentucky has those same issues of can, you know, because you can't really go into another foreign country and take someone out of that foreign country. Kentucky, though, if you can, you know, kind of share a little bit what, what our experiences have been in Kentucky as far as picking people up. It's almost like a foreign country. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's you have certain regulations and, and procedures you have to follow. And in many cases, it almost makes it hard to get in and get back out with someone to try to follow every specific regimen that, that Kentucky and many other states do as well. You have to know exactly what each state requires and or doesn't require for you to enter that state to apprehend and uh, take into custody a fugitive. And so right off the top of my head, I can't remember all the ones that Kentucky has, but in reality, they don't allow bondsmen in and out of their state to right. do Recovery work. So there are other avenues, but you've got to be careful about that. It, it can be very difficult. So in my eyes, I would look at Kentucky, let's say, as another country, because I can't just walk across the road and pick them up and take them to jail. There is a little process to go through. And Illinois is a similar state. And uh, you know, given where we're located in the Midwest, it kind of creates an issue for us because, you know, Illinois you know, is, is the straight up and down version and, and Kentucky is the, the horizontal version. So there's just almost like this big blocking area. So if you want to go to Indiana and pick somebody up, you can do that. But then you've got to somehow get them back through either Illinois or Kentucky before you can get them back into our area here. Um, yes. And Wisconsin's the same way. So you have that great big, you know, sort of reverse L that's kind of a problem for us. In theory, I guess we could drive through, but it still creates a problem for us to go into those states, pick people up. It's one of the reasons why we try and, and have extraditable warrants, because we can go into those states and at least enlist the, the assistance of law enforcement. Hey, this guy's got a, an extraditable warrant. You know, can you pick this guy up for us? We can't pick him up, but you can. And then we can, you know, make the arrangements to get him brought back to, to the state of Kansas or wherever we happen to be. Correct. And it's always nice to have law enforcement involved. If, if it is an extraditable warrant, like Shane just said, um, that's a beauty. That's, that's a, a, a wonderful thing to have when you have a fail to appear that it's extraditable. I love to see that on the bottom of the warrant. It makes me feel like, oh, good. I've got some 
I've got some help possibly. Well, and, and hopefully it's it's an extraditable nationwide because you know a lot of these extradition things they might be neighboring states or there's there's a range there where you can just you know, if you go more than three or four hundred miles away, well we're not going to bring you back for that. And or if you you know ho- hopefully you work in a jurisdiction like my area, Johns County, they'll extradite anybody from anywhere. But I know the next county over one that county generally won't extradite you past 250 miles unless it's a, a certain level of felony. You know, that it's beyond, you know, it's level four or higher. They won't extradite you if you're more than 250 miles away, which is just an invitation to get out of town and get at least 250 miles away, which is not. I just hit that mark. I'm good. <laughs> exactly. So. Max actually calls the records department of the jail and, and figures out, you know, Beaumont's full name. That seems a bit much considering we are LA County. It's a huge jail. Maybe they're able to figure it out, but for purposes of the movie, they do figure it out. We'll, we'll play that clip here. Beaumont Livingston. Livingston, huh? <laughs> on his prior, he served nine months. He's working on four years probation. You don't say. You know what he's on probation for? I ain't got a clue. Possession of unregistered machine guns. Damn. Now, they gonna consider that a violation of his probation? They do consider this a violation of his probation. Your boy's looking at 10 years, mm-hmm. plus the concealed weapon. He ain't gonna like that. Beaumont ain't got a doing time kind of disposition. I need your name and address. Ordell Roby. O-R-D-E-L-L-R-O-B-B-I-E. 1436 Florence Boulevard, Compton. Nine zero two two two. Is that a house or an apartment? That's a house. So again, more Max Cherry being brutally honest, and more Samuel L. Jackson. I, I just love the Samuel L. Jackson character in this too. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's it's a great interplay off both of them. He's playing. I, I watched an interview with him talking about this, and basically he said this was the first character he ever played that had no redeeming social values. Um, he, he was charming. But, you know, he, he had no nothing that redeemed him to society. He was just stone cold, you know, leech, I guess. Um, so he started in you know, Beaumont Livingston and, and Ordell Snickers at that. Um, presumably, in, in my mind, as we learn later, because Mr. Livingston isn't going to be living too much longer because that was right. probably the whole reason he was there to bomb the guy out. Yes. As the movie, as you, you just kind of iterated about the future of this movie and how it's going to play out, but you're exactly right. That's possibly why he was trying to bond him and knew it, knowing that my full collateral kind of covers myself anyway. So when he gave the full 10,000 um, of, of if this individual is not going to be in our existence much longer. And, and that's one thing, a, a difference between the book and the movie um, that actually paints Max in a little bit better light because in, in the book, Rum Punch, the Ordell Roby character actually asked Max Cherry, well, what happens if he dies? Um, and I, I've had people ask me that before, clearly not intending that they're going to go out and kill that person. But what if he dies in a car wreck or something like that? But this situation might be a little bit differently. And so when Quentin Tarantino did the screenplay on that, he pulled that out because that por- sort of puts Max in a position of knowing what's going to happen here if, if he's asking about that stuff. So I think that was a, a conscious effort. Um, on Tarantino's part to to make uh, Max more likable to where he's not culpable in what occurs after. Correct. I, I do like, um, you said earlier, I, I love the fact that Samuel L. Jackson does play this Ordell Roby pretty, uh, yeah, kind of like a leech. And, and, I, and I like when Max asked, which I never really thought about this until just now when that, that clip was being played, that he asked him, is that a house or an apartment? And I think it's kind of important to, to, to think about that because as a bondsman, you are you are uh, giving collateral or giving a loan, so to speak, on a, in a quick fashion. So if you go to a, uh, a bank and try to get a loan for something of some sorts, they go through a some days a 30 days, a 45 day process of what we do in maybe 30 minutes. And part of that conversation to say, is this a house or an apartment? Well, if, then my next comment would be, do you own that house or do you rent it? Because it also it shows stability. It shows a person that if you own your home and you're in that home, that's a stable place because typically you just don't pack up and leave a home you own. And so those are questions. I know I'm kind of diverting from the movie a little bit, but it's questions that a bondsman gets involved with as they're preparing possibly to write a bond or give a person um the acknowledgement that we are going to write that bond. We kind of want to know a little bit about them and then have 
Now, how solid are they? Are they stable? Are they going to be here a while? Are they going to be here if I have to make a phone call like he did earlier in the movie, calling the mother of, of Reggie to see if he was still there? So, again, I kind of diverted there a little bit, but a little piece of the of the movie caught my, my ear just now. And it was, is that a home or apartment? Because sitting at my desk, I don't know what XYZ street is versus another street. So found that interesting. Well, especially the large city like that. But it's just another aspect that gives some more realism to to the yes. role and, and the movie here, because we don't always see that in, in bail related things. So Max bonds out Beaumont and Beaumont goes home. And we won't play a clip on that. But shortly after Wardell shows up, talks Beaumont in the trunk of his car on some scam that he's going to go help him, you know, scare some other people. And then drives him around into vacant lot and shoots him still in the trunk of the car. But alas, from from Ordell's perspective, Beaumont has already talked to the cops because after Beaumont's murder, we see Jackie being stopped by the police in the airport, her bag being searched and the police finding fifty thousand dollars in cash and two ounces of cocaine. So Jackie ends up in jail. So this is our first real introduction to Jackie past the introduction where we see her you know, going down the, the airport aisle and she ends up in jail. And she's charged and we see her in court. I'm going to play this, this clip on the, the court thing and kind of get your take on, on a couple different aspects of it here. So this is the Jackie's arraignment. Brown, case 70032. Charge is possession of narcotics with the intent to distribute. How does your client plead? Uh, your Honor, she wishes to stand mute. Very well. Detective Varga. Detective Vargas, Your Honor. Sorry. Uh, you were the arresting officer in this case? That's correct, Your Honor. And do you have a bail recommendation? Yes, I do, Your Honor. And that would be? Based on the defendant's prior conviction and the extreme possibility of flight due to the occupation, the state requests a bond of no less than 25000 And the people are fine with this? I'm going to set bond at 10000 and set the date of August 21st for the prelim. Your Honor, when will that be? That's six weeks from now, Ms. Brown. We'll continue this matter then. Owens, Kate. Okay, so I, I probably cut this scene a little bit longer than, than I need to do for, for a couple of reasons. Um, first is, is the music. So it leads into this music. The, the longtime woman song that plays for a little while. Because in the movie, Quentin Tarantino's really incorporated music and specific music into the film for each character. And, and later on in the movie, there's there's a scene with all the characters coming together. They each sort of have their own own theme song that comes along with that. Sort of a, a, an homage in, in the movie here is the, the, the song, Longtime Woman, was actually performed by Pam Greer, who plays Jackie Brown, but was performed by Pam Greer for a movie back in the early 70s where she was playing a, a female who, who was incarcerated. So, I mean, that, that homage to the, her prior roles and then that black exploitation you know, genre of film is, is definitely in there. And, and the other part that I kind of kept, kept in there was, was the jail door slamming closed. When I first started, our jail had, had that same kind of door, that, that slow moving mechanical door with a resounding boom at the end when it closed, like, like it was designed for nothing other than to, to drive home the fact that, hey, you're in jail. You know, so I, I did make it a little bit longer for that because just those two things, the, the jail door, that, that was one of the spookiest things when I first started doing them. I mean, we don't, we don't have that same door anymore, but man, when I first started, you know, 35 years ago at the old jail that we had, and it was, it was the door. I mean, it would just come right across very slowly. And then just, you wouldn't think it could even be that loud when it got to the very end and you just, just rattled the whole, the whole hallway. I don't know if the jails, if you had a, a door like that at your jail or not, I know that was pretty standard back in the day. Our, ours are a swinging door, but as softly as you could probably close it, it still went funk or had that, that <laughs> resonating sound of just steel and concrete. And you could try to just tap it shut. It wouldn't do it. It just slammed. Yeah, the doors do kind of feel like I am now locked in. Right. I mean, it, it's, it, def it's definitely sending a message with those doors. But away from the music and the doors, the arraignment itself did strike me as pretty accurate for initial charging appearances. I mean, a little bit different. I mean, you generally don't have the officer there making statements in, in mind. But they, how do they typically handle those sorts of arraignments or, or initial charging uh, hearings in your area? Uh, very similar, but I, I agree. We, uh, the charging officer or the detective, if you will, I don't know 
that always seemed kind of odd to me because it's usually a prosecuting attorney out of whether it be a district attorney's office or a county attorney's office, depending on your situation. And also for our area, your first arraignment or preliminary arraignment, I guess you could say, is usually not with an attorney at all. We have an appointment process before you get your attorney. And then later at the next appointed or the next hearing date, that attorney would be there with you, whether you've decided to hire the attorney on your own and retain it, or you were uh, given the opportunity to uh, receive an appointed counsel. They're not there at that initial setting. So the setting of bond is then just basically between the, the position of the prosecuting attorney and the judge based on the information that is in front of them. And, and again, prior history and different things is kind of how they set the bond in our area. So there's not an attorney unless you've hired one on your own prior to that first appearance. Otherwise you're there by yourself. And, um, and a reason I call it a preliminary arraignment is because there's not a necessity to make a formal plea at the time. Right. You have the opportunity to hear the charges being presented. And then from that point is your, position to decide how do I want to move forward with retention of attorney or possibly appointment of attorney. So those are the differences that I, I find in most movies that you see, whether one like this one is based on a, a bail bondsman that we're reviewing or just any type of criminal type show that you watch, they seem to have that attorney right there with them at that initial appearance. And that is just something different that, that I don't see in, in the courts that I'm involved with. Right. Well, that's true. Um, I think this is probably, you know, it probably drew from Los Angeles to a certain extent because it's a larger area. Um, the, the both prosecutor and the, the defense attorney, because I think there was a court appointed attorney there, but that court appointed attorney knew nothing about the case at all. Um, right. And the, you know, the prosecutor really didn't know that much more either. So given that they were just in that early stage, the, the, the court is probably relying on the officer's statements surrounding that more so than statements of the court. Whereas in jurisdictions, we work in a little bit smaller, the, the prosecutors are probably much more involved in that before they actually charge them. And so they're a little bit more familiar familiar with the, the charging affidavit and the charging documents where they can make those arguments versus clearly in this area, neither one of those two attorneys, you know, knew anything about this case at all. It was just, we were processing people through. Right. Right. It was, it just, that's a perfect example. We're processing. That's right. That's it. And he pointed out the, the, the plea thing. I know in Kansas, you don't, on, on felony charges, you don't actually have to make a plea until after your preliminary hearing, until you're bound over a speedy trial. And those things don't even kick in until then. So this is just, hey, this is your probable cause hearing. There's enough cause to charge you. Now we'll look down the road at getting enough evidence to take you to trial. So Ordell, uh, we'll play this next clip. Ordell's sitting in the back of the courtroom and, uh, you know, watching what's going on. And it is kind of interesting that, those two officers are there and they're after Ordell. They know Ordell's name and they walk right past him without even acknowledging that he's there or even recognizing him. But we'll play this clip. Um, this is a long clip and there's a whole lot to unpack, but it's it's probably the a, after the first meeting with Max Cherry, it's probably the quintessential moment of the movie. So I'll play this and, and listen to this here. I didn't hear you wash your hands. Comfortable? Yeah, those open, so I just come on in. I can see that. Why? Got some more business for you. Oh, yeah? what do he do? She is an airline stewardess. Got caught coming back from Mexico with some blow. They set her bond this afternoon at $10,000. Now, I'm figuring you can take that $10,000 you owe me from Beaumont and move it over to the stewardess. The bond for possession's only a thousand. Mm. Yeah, man, they fucking with her. They calling that shit possession with intent. A 44-year-old black woman caught with less than two ounces, they call that shit intent. The <laughs> same thing happened to a movie star. They call it possession. Still sounds high. Well, um, she had on, I believe it was, um, 50 grand in cash. All right, before we start talking about stewardesses, let's get Beaumont out of the way first. Uh, you know, I think somebody already did. What? You ain't here? Here what? Somebody with a grudge blew Bowmouth's brains out. Oh, shit. That shit rhymed. Blew Bowmouth's brains out. <laughs> Police made contact with you? Oh, hell yeah. First motherfucking thing they did. 
you know, they see I pay a big money bond for my boy. They start thinking with that, where there's smoke, there's fire logic. You know, rousted my ass out of bed at 10 o'clock in the morning. Scared the shit out of my woman, Sharonda. She thought they was going to take my ass away for sure. The stewardess, you know her last name? Mm-hmm. Brown. Jackie Brown. What does she do for you? Who says she do anything for me? She my friend. My friends get in trouble. I like to help them out. All month work for you. This you and me talking, you know, like lawyer client thing, and you can't tell nothing I say to you. You're not my client, so you get busted, and I bind you out. Well, uh, we ain't got no uh, what you call that shit, confidentiality. Why should I tell you anything? Because you want me to know what a slick guy you are. You got stewardesses bringing you 50 grand. And why would a stewardess be bringing me 50 grand? Now you want me to speculate on what you do. I'd say you're in the drug business, except the money's moving in the wrong direction. Whatever you're into, you seem to be getting away with it, so uh, more power to you. All right. You want another bond? You want to move the 10000 you got on Beaumont over to the stewardess? That means paperwork. I got to get a death certificate, present it to the court, make out a receipt for return of bond collateral, type up another hey, application. Hey, 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 hey man, Jack ain't got time for all that Look, shit. Look, I'm telling you what I have to do. What you have to do, in case you forgot, is come up with a premium of 1000 bucks. I can do that. You know I got the money. I just ain't got it with me. Come back when you do. I'll bond out the stewardess. You got to look at this with a little compassion, all right? Jackie ain't no criminal. She ain't used to this kind of treatment. Now, gangsters, they don't give a fuck. But you know, your average citizen, a couple of nights in county, get to fucking with their mind. Ordell, this isn't a bar. You don't have a tab. Listen to me, all right? You got a 44-year-old, gainfully employed black woman, falsely accused falsely of... Falsely accused? She didn't come back from Mexico with cocaine on her? Falsely accused of intent? Now, if she had that shit, and mind you, I'm saying if, that was her own personal shit to get high with. Is white guilt supposed to make me forget I'm running a business? Oh, it's like that, huh? All right. I got you a little thousand bucks. Okay, so there's there's just so much to unpack in this scene. You know, again, it's it's just four minutes long, but it's it's the perfect encapsulation of, of dealing with clients. You know, first off, the collateral refund for Beaumont. Um, you know, we get calls all the time. You know, when do I get my money back? Well, now, you know, 90% of the, or 99% of those are, they're wanting to know when they get the bond fee that they paid us back. They're not wanting to know when they get collateral because they probably didn't put up collateral, you know, because right. this doesn't normally happen. And, but this is one little inconsistency in here as far as, I mean, one, I think this is, it looks very accurate to me, but there's a, an inconsistency is that Max doesn't know that Beaumont's dead. How did the police know that Ordell was the one that posted the bond? You know, I mean, if, if the police showed up and roused Ordell after, you know, in, in theory, because he posted a big money bond, that information would have had to come from Max. And, you know, Max should have known that unless there's some other procedures in California or wherever that you have to identify who put up the money for it, which seems to be a little unusual. That's not that's not fairly common. So that that thing throws me off just a little bit. And then there's the confidentiality. So, so is there is there such a thing as, as a bail bondsman client privilege? I would say no. Um, there is a civil contract when, we, when you have a person that does come in and, and uh, present themselves as the the money person or the we call it the indemnitor. They're right. indemnifying the bond. And I've always stated that unless the courts have asked me. I don't just automatically give that information to people because that is a civil contract. It's a, it's a personal contract, but attorney client privilege, we do not have. If we are subpoenaed to go to court for whatever happens in our office or on any other type of conversation, we would be obligated to respond to the questions that are asked to us. So oddly enough, it's kind of interesting that, that this whole conversation in a bail bondsman's office if Max would work it longer, he would be told anything and everything, because that's just, in my opinion, Ordell sitting there basically spilling his guts. Yeah, and he wants, take a he wants to tell him. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm a, Ordell's becoming a salesman, but to become that salesman to this bondsman, to take this bond, or to anything else that he wants to do, um, Ordell kind of just starts spilling his guts, so to speak. And like you said earlier in your statement was, Max didn't know that, that 
uh, Beaumont was dead yet. He probably will shortly, um, but he didn't know at that moment. It literally, I guess, in, in movie time frame, it happened yesterday, so to speak. Right. And so it's still yet to unfold. And and it is, I, I found that funny as well, that, that Ordell's, ex- I got up at, they woke me up early at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, a little later in my book, but uh, again, that's that's his morning. Uh, and then to move on with my, you know, scared Sharon to my, my girlfriend at the time, it, it just plays into the, the role of Ordell in this movie is, hey, I'm a, I'm a player. Right. And if I play Max, I'm going to keep on playing. But Max being a very sure-footed bondsman or sure-footed business person was able to kind of look through it, so to speak, and, and ask the questions that needed to be asked. And whatever those responses happened to be, took them with a grain of salt. And then I, I just love the way he just stayed calm. You know, right. he never really changed his voice. He never changed his position. He said, you know, there's still a fee due for this bond. You know, it's not, you know, this isn't a, a, a credit line that I give you for just because you were in here a week or so ago. I just love the way Max just stayed his ground and didn't change his tone, didn't change his, his, his thought process, stayed on, stayed on point on how I deal with my business and how I need to receive the information to make sure that this is a, um, a qualified bond for me to write. So well, and it's it's easy to do when when someone becomes agitated because clearly you know during part of that conversation you know how agitated you know, the Ordell Roby character really was and how much that was a front we don't know but it's very easy when you're dealing with someone and they become agitated to respond in kind. Right. But you generally, don't get a good response when you when you do that, and then then suddenly you know things have fallen apart and you're you're busy yelling at each other and to to no end there. I do have a, a real story, which kind of I stumbled across years ago about, about the bail bondsman confidentiality case. And that's based right here in Kansas. I was doing some, some research on bond forfeiture stuff. And so I came across some Kansas case law. And so this guy's on a recorded line at the jail talking to his bail bondsman, try, trying to convince the bail bondsman along the same lines to, to post his bond for an armed robbery charge. And, and despite the bail bondsman telling him to stop talking <laughs> about the case because the call was being recorded the defendant continued talking telling the bondsman that he wasn't going to run I, there's no way i'm going to run and i don't need to run because because the cops couldn't prove that he robbed anyone because he was wearing a mask at the time and no one could identify him <laughs> and so that actually made it into the the appellate record and so they referenced that in in the case citation and hey the bondsman even told him he was being recorded i mean this is an admission against interest but it's like so there there has absolutely no confidentiality there <laughs> And we all know every call we take from a law enforcement facility, it says right on it, this is a recorded call for your protection or whatever. So it's being told to you several times in the process of taking a phone call from an inmate uh, or any defendant at that matter. And, and I, I find that's funny. I guess I didn't realize that that case law was out there quite like that. That's that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, because and, and obviously, you know, they uh, they upheld the conviction. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Made it a little easier for the prosecution, I think. I would think, since you would basically have you know, an admission on a recorded line. Well, you can't prove that I did anything because I was wearing a mask. Like, right. Okay, moron. I also like the part where, you know, I got the money. I just don't have it on me. And that's. <laughs> And if you watch the movie, you'll find that he's opening up a fanny pack that he opened up the same way he did the last time when he was in front of Max and he pulled out the 10,000. He just happened to have a lot of cash in that same fanny pack that he was wearing into Max's office this time as well. Right. It just that that happens so often. Well, I, I you know, you need to cut me a break on this because I, I don't have them like, yeah, sorry, I can't. And then we're well, fine. You know, now there is, that is a difference uh, in between the movie and the book. In the book, Ordell does not actually have the money, but gives Max a Rolex watch to, in theory, hold for the money. Because what you see in the book is, you know, they kind of end that conversation. He's like showing the watch. Hey, isn't this a watch of beauty? And so then you don't hear anything. But then when he's out, uh, when Max is there bonding Jackie out, he's checking the time on the Rolex watch that he got from Ordell. So, I mean, that's not really in this movie, but... I know that that's an argument that's been made on a lot of different issues is, is bondsmen taking items in lieu of the fee and stuff along those lines. I don't know if that's, it's not something I've done in, I, when we first started doing it, 
you know, I learned my lesson pretty early on. Don't do that one. You know, the, the Rolex you probably has is probably fake. And you know, that if it's all said and done, when you go to give that property back or they come pay it up, I mean, you're not a pawn shop. You're not a, like I said, I'm not a bar. You don't have a tab. Then you're responsible for whatever may have occurred to that during the meantime. What happens if you turn around and take that watch off and drop it and break your, you know, $10,000 Rolex watch? Well, now you're going to have to fix that watch before you, when you give it back to them. Um, so I didn't know if that was something you do. I, I know that some bondsmen do It's just, I know I've gotten, I haven't done anything along those lines for 30 years. It just, it was what never worked out for me. You're exactly right. I've, I've tons of people that come in and I've got a computer. I've got this, I've got something and, and great. I appreciate that. But I am, again, you, you use the exact terminology that I many times use. I am not a pawn shop. If that is something that you feel that has some value, then to take it to a place that that's the business they are in. We're not in that business. And so I find it difficult to take property. And you're right. I'm 22 years that I've been doing this. You find out early on the things that you, sh you need to cease because it really doesn't work. And it, it just seems like a bad practice in my book. So I, well, I had I had a guy that uh, gave me his his little string guitar. He was like, "This is this is a great guitar, and you know, you know, hold it for seventy five dollars. I got to get this guitar back." He came back to my office three times to play the guitar. <laughs> Never did bring us the seventy five dollars, and he showed up on the three different occasions. Like, can I see my guitar? I'm like, you know, you can have it if you can just bring me the seventy five dollars. But and he'd sit there on the chair in the office and and play a song for five minutes or so, and then he's like, "Okay, I'll go get that money together. Come back." Nope. Three different times I got to be serenaded and we ended up selling in a garage sale like five years later. It's like, I don't take that stuff anymore. And um, I had a good example of that too. I have a, I have a wedding ring that I received that obviously I want my wedding ring back. Right. And sim similar, about the same, not much. And I'm like, I don't want a wedding ring, but I felt, you know, that's a pretty legitimate piece of jewelry. And I, that would have been probably 18 years ago because I would have been early on in, in, in my bonding career. And I'm not so sure if I don't still have that somewhere because I don't think anybody ever came and picked it up. And so that's that's the other side of things that I look at. I'm going, I, I don't want a collection of things. It's not how I pay bills, not how we run a business. So it's just the best just to not accept them and and direct them to someplace that does. Well, and if you take it, everybody wants retail for it. It's like, yep. you know, and you're not going to get that out of it. You know, I'm, I'm not a jewelry store and, you know, I'm not a pawn shop. You know, I, most I can do is take it to a pawn shop and, you right. know, they're going to give me 10 cents on the dollar for it. So yep. you, know, you better be giving something. Yep. So anyway, um, Max posts the bond for Jackie and, and is clearly struck by her. Um, he actually takes her out for a drink and gives her a ride home. During the ride, Jackie steals his pistol out of the glove compartment of his car. Ordell shows up at Jackie's house later on, and, and we expect, or at least the, the general idea is a repeat of the Beaumont scene. You know, Ordell is eliminating witnesses here. But Jackie has the gun, and at gunpoint, talks Ordell into a scheme to pay her off for her silence if she has to go to jail. So then Max shows up at her house the next day to get his gun back, and for whatever reason, even offers to let her keep it for a while if she needs it to feel safe. Which, which is a really strong indication he's lost perspective on this, you know, yeah. already. Um, I, I assume that, that you wouldn't be willing to, to loan guns to clients to, you know, keep, help keep, keep them safe. I, I wouldn't even have gone to the far as taking her home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My first piece was starting at the very beginning. That would have happened, you know. And, and yeah, you, you said it exactly. When, when Jackie comes walking out, he... You could see he was smitten <laughs> already and uh, didn't even see the fact that I'm a businessman. This is the business that I'm in. I'm just seeing Jackie as as a person. So which is which is fine. But, yeah, I wouldn't have even have taken her home. Right. Uh, yeah, that does create a whole host of them because they, they took her out for a drink and then took and dropped her off at the house. I mean, it was. It was involved and of course then shows up the next day. Now the clip I've got here was from him talking uh, to her at, at her apartment the next day. And I don't know that it's, it's terribly central to the plot, but I, I think it's something that we recognize and deal with our clients here. So I'm going to play this one here. Something else were you? Um, I always feel like I'm starting over. How many bonds you said you wrote? 15,000. Is that a lot? 
It's plenty. Well, I've flown over seven million miles, and I've been waiting on people for 20 years. And after my bus, the best job I could get was with Cobbleware, which is the worst job you could get in this industry. You know, I make 16,000 a year, plus retirement benefits that ain't worth a damn. And with this arrest hanging over my head, Max, I'm scared. And if I lose this job, I gotta start all over again, and I ain't got nothing to start over with. I'll be stuck with whatever I can get. And that shit is more scary than Ordell. So I, I think this this did strike me as kind of representative of what a lot of clients are feeling, you know, following an arrest. It's like, okay, you know, weren't thinking about it beforehand. And that's part of the problem with, with you know, the, the criminal aspect of society is a lot of times there's not a whole lot of forethought and you get yourself into a situation and then you're into that situation and then you're like, okay, what's going to happen to me now? But I mean, have you had clients talk about this, the, the fear and the setback associated with getting an arrest? I mean, obviously not, you know, sitting in a bathroom in their apartment, but, you know, um, at, at other other times. I think that's a big thing. Many of the clients, in fact, just actually won this morning. I finally got myself going down the right path. I got a great job. And then this happens. Right. Well, this happened because you didn't stop part of and, and I'm just using a vague example here. But um, the reason you're now in trouble is because part of the things that you had done before that created this problem, you're still doing. Yes, I'm so proud of you for getting a, a quality job at a great company. And just like she said, I I had to revert to the lowest flight company or, 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 or airline company because of maybe my past or anything. But she had retirement and she had some other things, too. Well, that's like these individuals that we're helping. Many times they've never had a, a, a job that had retirement or a job that had insurance uh, for that matter. And they finally have it and it never fails. As soon as they get something like that, it's within a short period of time, either something has caught up with them or they just are still dealing with the same things they had already been dealing with, the same people, same situations, and they get caught up in it. Um, the other one that I always find, this one I actually find kind of humorous and I think some judges do too, that many, many first appearances, uh, at those moments, it's amazing how many individuals that maybe haven't had a job for five years, and, and I might be expanding there, but they've always got an interview tomorrow, or they've got an interview that they just got set up. And it's and I find that the judges many times, I, I feel like they have a hard time sometimes not holding back that smirk, because it, it's like a repetitive thing that they hear almost from every single defendant that's in front of them, maybe not everyone, but a large majority that man, I've got an interview tomorrow or I had, or I had an interview that I just missed because it was yesterday and I got arrested two days ago. And then the second question is judge or from the judges, well, how long have you been out of work? Well, about two and a half years or three years, but it just so happened that all this ongoings has create that, that you walked into, but you now have that great opportunity for an interview. And it, it is kind of humorous and bear with me. I don't mean to sound disrespectful to any of those people, but cause it's very possible they did have an interview, but it's yeah, just but ironic. <laughs> tomorrow is always a day away. Exactly. And I've, it's just very humorous to me, but yes, in regards to Jackie, there's tons of clients that come in and, and maybe everything has worked out for them. And they did kind of fall into a, an oddity for them and they do have a great job. And I believe that that's also what a bondsman part of a bondsman's job is to enable that in individual to continue their work, continue if they've got a great job so they can be out of custody to uh, help their attorney work on their case, Cre continue to be a, um, an ongoing uh, supporter of the society and and support their family and, and do the things that are necessary within their uh, uh, own personal life. And if usually or many times, if you have a case, but you've had a job for a while and you're doing a good job with that or doing a good service for, with that job, your employers will typically work with you. And but when they're sitting in our offices, that is some of the things they're crying or, or I'm going to lose everything. I've, I've worked so hard for it's like, no, just, just sit tight. You know, this is a, this is a roadblock. This is a, a stepping stone or a, or a speed bump, so to speak, you will get through this. But um, yeah, it's quite often that 
people are here and they, especially ones that have that are actually been working for a long time and have worked their way up in, in, in their career and something happens because anything can happen to anybody, whether it be a, a DUI that just, you know, happens. Um, you have an argument somewhere and it turns into a lot more than you ever expected it to. Um, that there's a little, there's things that happen that, that you didn't create. It just happened. And uh, um, I find that those individuals have a tendency to have better careers, so to speak, that they're worried about losing. Well, and I, on this one, you don't really know if it's Jackie's honest feeling. I mean, it, it seems like it is, but it also, you know, she's just formulating this plan. Um, yeah. and, and, and this is probably part of her rationalization for why that she needs to go through this plan. And so, so following this, the, the movie moves on and, and Jackie's working on a plan, working with the cops, working with Ordell, trying to get this whole you know, scam set up uh, on a plan to bring back the rest of Ordell's money, half a million dollars from Mexico. And, and she's trying to hook May Max in the plan because she needs someone a little more legitimate on the outside to kind of walk through that. And I'm going to play this next clip because it kind of gets into toward the closing here of, of the movie and, and, and what Max is going through here. And so we'll play this here. So he's talking he's to her in the mall. He's more interested in Ordell and using the money. If he does anything suspect, it'll be cutting corners to get the conviction, but he wouldn't walk off with the money. It's evidence. And what about you, Max? What? If I was in Nicolette's place? No, I mean you right now, not if you were somebody else. I saw an opportunity to walk away with a shopping bag full of money, would I take it? You know where it came from. It's not like it's somebody's life savings. It wouldn't even be missed. Half a million dollars will always be missed. You're avoiding the question, Max. Okay, sure, I guess I'd be tempted. Especially now since I'm getting out of the bail bond business. Why? A lot of reasons. I guess the main one would be... Uh, Tired of it. When did you decide? It's been a long time coming, but uh, I finally made up my mind. I guess it was Thursday. Ms. Brown? Yes? I'm Max Cherry, your bail bondsman. The night you got me out of jail? Yeah. I went to pick up this guy. I hear he's staying at a house, and uh, I sneak in, and I'm waiting for him. Oh, wait a minute. After we were together, you snuck into a guy's house? Yeah. Went back to my office and found out that you took my gun, got another gun and the stun gun, went to this guy's house in El Monte and waited for him to come home. What do you do when he comes home? Shoot him with the stun gun. While he's incapacitated, uh, you cuff him and take him to county. <laughs> you do that? That's my job. Did you do that that night? Well, the guy never came home. But I'm sitting on his couch in the dark, holding my stun gun. The whole house smells of cat pee. And after a couple of hours, I think, what am I doing this? It's 19 years of this shit. And I make up my mind. That's it. I'm not sure you answered my question, Max. Which one? If you had the chance, unemployed now, to walk away with a half million dollars, would you take it? So two two points that come out of this, aside from, from Jackie, like like really putting the hook in the max, you know, can you walk away with half a million dollars? Is is the description of sitting in a house drenched in cat pee in the dark, rethinking your job? I mean, how many of us have sat there doing something, you know, going out to pick people up thinking, why the hell am I doing this? So, I mean, right. that really struck me as, you know, a, an accurate statement. Now, how often do you hear? Because it seems like I hear this all the time from different bondsmen about, well, we're, I'm getting out of this business. You know, this sucks. I'm getting out of this. But they never seem to actually get out of it. So I'm not, how, how often in other people that you deal with, other bondsmen, do, do you hear the whole, you know, this sucks, I need to get out of this business, find something else to do? I feel like not, like he just said he was in this 19 years. He goes, why am I doing it? You know, early on in your career, everybody's career, or anybody's new job, they think, well, this is exciting, it's fun, I'm enjoying it. And then as it kind of slowly progresses, um, things start to just become a monotony and you 
again, see the same thing many times over and over again. And you're always dealing with a problem. You know, somebody's gone to jail, somebody's, and, and the first part of me is I love to help people, just love to help people. But then you got to look at the reverse side. When something goes wrong, they fail to appear, for example, that is not as near as fun. And you don't know what you're walking into. And like he was sitting in a house, which I don't know if I've ever sat in a house waiting for somebody to come home. Maybe I've been sitting outside the house and then entered the house, but he did it a little differently. But yeah, when I'm, I'll do, use myself as an example. Each time that I've had to go out and pick somebody up, I go home and I kind of refresh on everything I'm going, well, I guess it went okay. It might not have gone exactly the way I wanted it to. Maybe there was a little scuffle, so to speak, or, or, or maybe it went perfectly. But I still look back and I go, this is not what I expected to do when I graduated college and started my career as an accountant, that it wasn't my my dream job. Let me say that. Uh, I grew up on a farm. I didn't even know anything about a bail bonding company. And so as my life changed, it, it, it led into, I love to help people. I love the, the, the law. And I think a lot of individuals that get into the business, they, they see an opportunity. like, okay, this is a business, but there's little bits and pieces of every type of business that you might not always like. Right. And for me, no, I don't love to go out and pick people up. It's not, it's not the part of it that I like. And I don't think it should be that way. If, if you love that part of it, you might have a little, I, I think you might need to tighten that screw a little bit because it makes, for me, it makes me a little, your, your blood starts to, you know, to, to work a little harder. Your, your heart starts to beat a little bit more. And after it's all said and done, you kind of come down. It's like, I just got done running a race. And everything calms down because you don't know what you're walking into. It could be, like I said earlier, it could be so simple or it could be something that becomes a little more problematic. And that's why it's always nice to have officers involved. But I use myself as an example. And I just love my job, love what we do. Um, I love helping people and them understanding what we do. But there is parts of it that aren't the most fun in the world. Right. Yeah. And the, the adrenaline aspect of that and you're putting yourself, I mean, you do see some of the worst aspects of society and, you know, that wears on you over time. Yeah. Yes. yes. So back and to the movie, though, um, Max does buy into the scheme and, and he and Jackie successfully liberate the money from both Ordell and the police. She leaves it in the dressing room in the, as the, in the mall and, and Max walks in and retrieves it and walks away. So he's the second person. She leaves it there, sets up this other scheme and he just walks out with it. And Ordell is in full-blown rage mode trying to figure out what happened to all his money. And this does lead to one of the most iconic lines about Bondsman in the movies. And I'm going to play that here and get your comment on that. Unless, you know, either she's got it or the Fed's got it. Or, or, now check this out. What if she gave the money to somebody else first before Melanie even went in the dressing room? Uh-huh. Oh, man, you know what? What? Uh, you know... You know who I saw in the dress department? No, tell me. And I didn't think anything of it. I'm, no, no, I did wonder what he was doing there. I wondered what he was doing there, but I thought it had nothing to do with us. Like, maybe he's with his wife or his girlfriend. It's a big place. Louis, a lot Louis, of people Louis. Do you go tell me who you saw? Yeah, Max Cherry. Max Cherry? You see Max Cherry in the dress department where we... Man, look at me when I'm talking to you. You see that motherfucker in the dress department when we about to get a half million dollars and you don't think nothing about him no, being why? there? why? Do they know each other? Hell yeah, they know each other. He bonded the ass out of county. Well, how am I supposed to know you that? You know he a bail bondsman, don't you? You know all them motherfuckers is crooked as a barrel of snakes, don't you? Why should I think something's weird if I don't know nothing about So when we talked about Midnight Run, we talked about the issue of culture and you know how things become the common knowledge. And, and so then the question, I guess, is does everyone know that, quote, bondsmen are all as crooked as a barrel of snakes, end quote? That's it's funny that you brought that. that that's the part that that uh, was brought up, because it also makes me feel like back to the used car salesman. I think I use that as an example in mm -hmm. the uh, Midnight Run uh, movie with the um, with the bail bonds kind of heading kind of a greasy looking hair hairdo and and kind of a i don't know a 70s vibe look of, of a shirt which i realized it was during that time frame but it just it, it didn't fit the business model i guess i could say that i see you or, or try to look to represent as well uh, we're we're we insure to the courts and we also have to be responsible to the courts so i feel like being crooked is not a good idea <laughs> 
it doesn't make your business last very long, but it is the key because that's what's always represented in movies is there's a little snake, so to speak, in that that company um, of a bail bondsman. And um, uh, no, I don't like it, but it is part of the movie uh, intrigue. Well, and Samuel L. Jackson has to get a snake comment into most of his movies, you know, yeah. so. Yes. Um, so anyway, Ordell calls Max, threatens him and Jackie. They lure him to Max's office where the ATF agent shoots and kills Ordell, which brings us to the end of the movie. And so we'll play our last clip here and kind of wrap this up because I know we are running a little bit long. Um, a few days after Ordell was shot, Jackie shows up at the bail bond office. And, and this is this is our, our kind of our closing scene here. Knock, knock. Hey. Hey, you. I got your package. It was fun getting a half million dollars in the mail. Less 10%. Why'd you take so little? That's my fee. This isn't a bail bomb, Max. I uh, hesitated taking that much. But you earned it. Well, I'm leaving now, and, you know, I'm all packed up, ready to go. That's our Dells. They confiscated everything else. Registration was in the glove box keys underneath the seat. Hey, <laughs> what's the matter? Haven't you ever brought somebody's car before? Not after they're dead. I didn't use you, Max. I didn't say you did. And I never lied to you. I know that. We're partners. I'm 56 years old. I can't blame anybody for anything I do. Do you blame yourself for helping me? No. Well, look, I'd really feel a whole lot better if you took some more money. You'll get over that. Where are you going? Spain. Madrid or Barcelona? Mm, Madrid first. Have you been there? I hear they don't eat dinner until midnight. You want to go? Thanks, but uh, you have a good time. You sure I can't twist your arm? Thanks for saying that. But no. Are you scared of me? A little bit. I'll send you a postcard. Will you? That's your little partner. Jerry Bailbon. Uh, what is it your son's charged with? Yes, that's a very serious offense. Is your son still in school? Does his father still live in the house? Could I excuse myself, and would you call me back in about half an hour? Yes, thank you. So, despite his earlier claims, it, it appears that Max is is not getting out of the bail bond business. I mean, it's the it's the, the pull of the pull of the phone. Got to answer the phone when it rings. And like I mentioned more, this seems to be a pattern that mimics real life. Most most bail bonds that I know are. are not really looking for something else to do, even though they'll talk about it all the time. And, you know, despite how much they complain about it, we can't seem to get rid of them all. There's so much talk about the ending that, you know, cause it's, it's a Tarantino ending. It's, it's not M night Shyamalan who just leaves you at this twist ending, but it kind of leaves you hanging. So what happens after that? And we don't know. And so you can speculate on that, but in the end, most bail bondsmen I know really do like this movie, um, and me, me included. The, the Max Cherry character played by Robert Forster does, does not seem like a slimy character. You know, it, it's my understanding that prior to his death, he even, even came and spoke to the professional bail agents in the United States you know, about the role and, and, and the, the job that we do. And, so, but, and I know we've kind of touched on this before, but why do you think Max resonates so much with, with bail bondsmen? I think he just hit right on it. He just seems to have that... I'm, I'm, I am a good guy. I am a, an honest person. I'm here to help when I can. I, I lay the things out as, as best I can when you, that last call he took. Um, 
it was this person's son seemed kind of young or whatever but he he dealt with it in the same manner as he dealt with the very first call that he was dealing with when you first started the movie he was on the phone well he somewhere there he was on the phone with another uh family member or whatever or with that with reggie trying to get his mother to, to help him out it's just i'm calm i'm here to help do what i can and and max really portrayed that is his, his tone of voice never changed even when he was upset about something he just kind of played that i'm here to 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 do my job the best i can i'm ensuring the courts that this person is going to appear in court and get that case to a final disposition but he never changed his position although he did kind of fall in love so to speak but but he he still kept that i'm like at the very end well you only took 10 percent. well that's my fee i'm still a bondsman and it, it, i don't know i just I really don't know how to, to explain Max. He just, he just sticks with you. He just, this is a, this is a good guy. And he has all this stuff going on around him, especially with an Ordell, which I know we all have an Ordell that comes into our office occasionally. It just, they, we just do, but um, they can be a little bit to handle sometimes. And Max did a great job of handling the situations that he was either putting himself into or that were presented to him. And I, just, I, I really liked it. So back on the bail in, in the movies aspect of things, and I know we, we've run long, so we'll kind of wrap it up here and I'll give you the, the final say on this, but it's like, you know, when we look at these bail bond movies, you know, does it paint the bail bond business in a positive light or a negative light? I mean, there's arguments about that. You could say that Max is not the greatest guy. I mean, he's hitting on female clients. He's, he's, you know, helping her steal a bunch of money from somebody. I mean, th there's some negative things, but the fact that he doesn't seem to be dishonest, I think kind of counters that. I mean, there's there's some arguments there that, you know, Max is written as the every man in the movie, the, the, the character that the audience is supposed to identify through. And so he's going to have a more positive view of that because people can overwrite their own feelings onto Max. But Generally, in your opinion, does, does Max paint us in a, a in a positive light, or or is he truly as crooked as a barrel of snakes? You know, I, I I like to think that he was being a positive light, but occasionally, like you said, there was some directions he was going that I I kind of went I cringed a little bit on, but I feel like the movie is still a movie, and there has to be a little bit of a of a of a direction that maybe you don't like at the time, but it always comes back to the end. And especially in a in a Tarantino movie, the end always comes to it all works out, so to speak. And Max, yes, he did get involved in some areas that he shouldn't have, which looked a little off, in my opinion. But as a whole, I still felt like he did a good job or the, the portrayal of his character was did a good job in, in shining a positive light, I guess you could say, on, on the process. Because many times, like you said, uh, Bail Bondsman's sometimes it's just a glimpse at him in a movie and, and they're that guy sitting behind a desk and being a little aggressive to some people and demanding. And he was never demanding. He was just, this is the way it is. This is the way we're supposed to be, or this is the way this, this process works. And as long as you kept it within the, the job itself, I thought he did a phenomenal job, but as movies go, they'll divert. And so, all right. I mean, you know, but in, in the, I guess the, the general tenor of it, I think he comes off very well and it paints us in a positive light, even though it is, it is a heist movie. So, I mean, you're going to have that aspect to it, but it, you know, the character itself, I think paints us relatively positive. So I, I think we, we agree on that. And so Dennis, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast today to, to share your bail in the movies expertise. Hopefully you can come again in the future and talk about more bail bonds in the movies and, and television. I, I hear that Ryan Gosling is working on a remake of the fall guy. Uh, that old Lee Majors stuntman slash bounty hunter TV show. Apparently they're going to turn that into a feature length movie. And you can tell us all about the experiences you had working as a stuntman before you went to accounting school and became a bail bondsman. There you go. Perfect. We'll make that a podcast number three. <laughs> all right. Well, we might do another one before then, but That's thank you again for coming on. Thank you for having me. Join us again next time for the bail in the Midwest podcast.